Hi, welcome to our training. We are starting this journey together and we hope you'll have fun and get a serious portion of uh, knowledge here. We'll be approaching many different lighting scenarios, focusing on both the why and the how. It'd be nice if you have some experience under your belt, but don't worry, uh, you don't need to produce over the top renders to get a good grasp of what you're about to learn. It's important that you've already dipped your toes in the water and now it's the time to organize what you do and what you know to go one step forward. You can totally relax today. There is no need to open 3ds Max. Uh, you can, uh, but uh, you know, for the most part, it's uh, the most important is to let the ideas flow and just get inspired. In the next lesson, we will go through the practical part one more time. So don't worry, you won't miss on anything. Today, we'll approach a daytime lighting scenario. This is the most common scenario and the most often used in commercial work. Up to 70 or 80% of the time, we are quoted exterior shots in the daytime scenario. So mastering this scenario is basically a must have, especially since the demand for such a shots is huge. The reason being we need to show the building and the entire space while it's used the most, that is during the day. So we'll dive deep into every detail of the daytime scenario in the upcoming seven lessons, you know, to hopefully give a full control over it. We'll slowly introduce new concepts and serve the knowledge in smaller chunks so you shouldn't be overwhelmed at any stage. Today, we'll create the daytime scenario using Corona Sun and Sky. This is a system built directly in Corona and we'll use it very often. We can put the sun in the scene and we can insert the sky that basically illuminates all the objects. We get a realistic ratio of the sun's brightness to the sky's brightness, completely for free. We also have a good ratio between the cold colors of the sky and the warm from the sun, but more on that later. Corona Sun and Sky is a physically correct lighting model and it offers great possibilities. We'll work on the daily scenario today, but you can use it for any scenario. It's very powerful. Everything you see in the screen right now is made with the help of Corona Sun and Sky only. So we really hope to encourage you to use it more often. Nevertheless, let's focus on the daily scenario for now. First, we'll discuss the most important parameters of Corona Sun and Sky, and then move to the implementation of the scenario. Setting up Sun and Sky is a very simple operation from a technical point of view. Just a few parameters to set. It shouldn't take more than 10, maybe literally 15 minutes if we are being thorough. However, we don't want the lighting process to be just random. We want to think, set the lighting and run the whole process consciously. It's something that is often overlooked and the end result is often actually quite random. Okay, so let's get to the scene. As we said, this first lesson is basically an introduction. You may not launch 3ds Max for now, but just watch what it's all about. Well, uh, let's start by loading Corona Sky and Corona Sun. You can do this in the Create panel. We go to the Lights tab, Corona, Corona Sun tab, and now basically we can click anywhere in the scene, drag our click, release the mouse button. Now by moving the mouse up and down, we can choose the height of the sun above the horizon. We click again and we have the sun set in the scene. Once we have the sun in the scene, we can see what it looks like. So we click F10 on our keyboard or the gear icon to enter our render settings. And at this point, let's just go into interactive rendering to see what is actually going on in our scene. We will describe most of the sun and sky parameters during the next 25 minutes. It is going to be a very beginner-friendly fragment, so if you are already familiar with it and don't want to refresh it, you can skip the video until the next segment. And at this point, there are no materials in the scene, but don't worry, 
It's only temporary, just to show you how this system works. When you launch the scene included in this training, all the materials will be in place. And that's how it looks at the moment. We have the sun and, so far, just the sun. It gives us directional and direct light. What's more, we can see that all objects in the scene have a warmish shade. Basically exactly as we would expect from the sun. All that's left to do is to add the sky, that is a corona sky. Just enter uh, the modifiers while the sun is selected. You should see modifiers for the sun here. And now you can just click Add Corona Sky Environment and it should automatically add a Corona Sky. It will also be automatically affixed with the sun we have in the scene. At the moment our image is just a bit too bright so I will just adjust the exposure down so we can see some more details in the image. Ok, so we have Corona Sky environment appearing in the sky. Now we got a nice ratio of the warm sun and cold light coming from the sky. Warm highlights, cold shadows. Pretty cool color dance between the warm and cold ones. And ok, what can we do with all of this now? First of all, we can set the setting of the sun itself. We can rotate it as we see fit, choosing the direction of the sunlight. Besides the direction, we can also change the height of the sun in the scene. And doing so, we will also change the time of the day for our image. As I mentioned before, Corona Sun and Sky is a complete system and it reacts to how high the sun is above the horizon. It automatically matches the sky and the color of the sun. For example, the system understands that if the sun is close to the horizon, we should get a lighting that is close to the sunset. Similarly, if we move the sun higher, we will have illumination closer to the zenith. The sun's color will be cooler. The warm cold dynamic in the scene will also be more subtle. Ok, uh, let's go back to some kind of neutral position. If you select the sun, you'll have modifiers on the right. We can get through them fairly quickly because there aren't as many of them here. First, we have intensity value. You will use it to set the intensity of the sun. And note that the light coming from the blue sky is independent of this modifier. We basically change only the intensity of the sunshine in our scene. So, uh, for example, if we set 10% of the value, we can see that basically the shadows have not changed much. That's because of the lighting from sky. Uh, what changes are the highlights that are much softer, much cooler. It looks almost like the sun is shining through thick clouds. Similarly, we will have stronger contrast if we increase this value. the sunlight will be visible uh, more intensive. However, the light coming from the sky into these shadows will not change. We usually aim at the value of 1, which is a natural balance between sun and sky, and basically there is no need for us to modify it. The next parameter is size. This is simply the size of the sun's disk, and the rule to remember here is that the larger the sun's disk, the softer the shadows in our scene. For example, let's increase it to 64. Instantly we can see here in the viewport that the solar disk is bigger and all these shadows in the scene are much softer.
it looks a bit like the sun is being filtered by the fog or by thinner clouds. And again, if we go below the value of 1, these shadows will get sharper. On the other hand, if we set the value to exactly 1, which represents the natural size of the sun, the shadows will be still quite sharp. So basically, if you go below 1, you won't notice that much of a difference. And this works the same in real life. If we have, for example, a flashlight, a small light source, it will give us a very sharp beam of light. And if the light is coming through the windows or from some lamp mounted high on the ceiling, it will be more diffuse, the shadows will be softer. So to sum up, the greater the value, the softer the shadows, the smaller, the sharper. We also have the shadow from the clouds setting here, but we won't focus on it for a time being. We are going to have an extra lesson where we are going to talk about the clouds from Corona. Whether the setting is on or off, it doesn't really matter to us at the moment. What matters are these color options and we will talk about them for a bit. So far, we had, by default, a realistic option on. And the realistic option gives us the sun's color that matches its height above the horizon. So, as we said before, if the sun is lower above the horizon, then automatically its color will be warmer. And if it's higher, it will be colder. Basically, if we are going for realistic illumination in a scene, this realistic option is perfectly correct and we should just stick to it. However, in certain situations, we can decide to go in another direction. The color setting gives us quite a few interesting opportunities. First, there is a textured setting, but we are not gonna bother with it at all. Whether it is on or off, we probably won't see any difference because it concerns the uniformity of the solar disk color, so we can safely skip it. What interests us though is the possibility of replacing the realistic option with direct input. Look at this. If we turn the color of the sunlight on, it will sample the color from this bracket and at this point it will be just pure white. So what can we do with this? For example, we can apply a very warm color here and create the impression of a sunset when in fact our light source is much higher. And under normal conditions this would be just an afternoon. So we can cheat a little bit in that manner. We can, of course, also go completely crazy with this color and do really anything. However, of course, this is a less real-life example and there are very few situations in which we will be able to apply it. In addition to direct input, we can also enter the temperature in Kelvin. By default, it's 6500K, which is a neutral uh, color temperature, but we can warm it up by reducing the temperature here, or cool it down by increasing it. If the warm versus cold is the only issue for you, the color temperature should get you better results than direct input simply because the color temperature roots us in a realistic, very specific scale. We are not choosing arbitrary colors as we see fit, but actually we are moving along the scale of the temperature that light can take on. It is easier to set up and the effects are more natural. Anyhow, as I said, in most cases, realistic option is all we need. And the last thing that's left to talk about here is the visibility option. I'll drag the sun to the back of our frame so we can see it a bit better.
yeah, we can see the sun is out here somewhere and now we can deselect various options in the visibility of the sun. The first one is visible directly. So as we can see, somewhere in the sky, the solar disk is visible. Uh, it, was, it will simply disappear if we uncheck this option. You know, the sun is still there, it still shines on the scene, it would still reflect in various surfaces, but we simply cannot see it directly. And speaking of reflections, the second option allows us to cut down the reflections of the sun. Maybe you won't see this well in this simplified scene, cause uh, there is no materials for now. However, it would be very obvious if we had, for example, uh, water here. Even so, we can still notice that some of the highlights in materials come, in fact, from reflections, not direct sunlight as it may seem. And the highlights become much less noticeable as soon as we turn reflections off. So it's clear that a lot of what we see on the stones in this position of the sun are simply reflections. Of course, when we turn this option off, the sun also won't appear in reflections in glass, water and so on. Usually uh, we don't care that much about hiding the sun, so we have both visible in reflections and visible directly turned on. Often we even show it on purpose to make a picture more dramatic. Another aspect we can change with this option is the visibility of the sun in refractions. If we would look at the sun through some object made of glass or a water surface, then this would allow us to see the sun or hide it. However, in this scene we have other objects behind the glass and we don't look at anything through the water, so setting it on or off doesn't really matter. Similarly, generate caustics option won't interest us at this moment, because we are not operating on caustics yet. Now, this option is turned on, but at this stage it makes no difference for us whether it's off or on. Okay, that would be all for sun itself. Now we can talk about sky. I will move the sun to some more reasonable position, so it won't shine directly at the camera. And we have to go to the material editor if we want to modify the sky. We will work with the slate. We know it might not be your favorite thing to work with and we'll try to convince you in one of the next lessons that it's at least worth a try. But more on that later. Now we want to see what options you can choose from in Corona Sky. To enter slate, we have to hold down this icon Select the second option and the Slate Material Editor will open. After that we can click number 8 on the keyboard or enter the render environment. Corona Sky will be attached here by default. We can move it to Slate as an instance. That way all the modifications will be included in our render. And this is where we see the available sky options. There are quite a few of them, but as for now, we will only use two. We have different sky models here, although we never really change between them. The other sky models are the older ones from previous Corona versions. Basically, there is no need to change this. The newest one is set here by default, and that's what we are gonna to use. In the next point, we have the sky intensity. Just like with the sun, where we could modify the intensity of the sun itself, here we can adjust the intensity of the sky. So, for instance, by increasing this value to 2, 
we will make the blue light from the dome of the sky brighter. On the other hand, intensity of the sunlight won't change a bit. So by increasing this value, we reduce the contrast in the scene because the differences between the two lights simply become smaller. Similarly, if we reduce this value below one, we will get closer to the situation we had at the beginning, where we simply did not have the sky and the only source of light was the sun. Once again, the value of one is the default and we really don't need to touch it. This will give us the most realistic results. The next values we won't be using in the daytime scenario are turbidity and fake horizon blur. We don't want to complicate this lesson unnecessarily, so we will skip it for now. We'll come back to them in future lessons when it makes more sense to use them. But what would make sense for us now? For one, there's the altitude parameter. We can adapt the color of the sky to different altitude above sea level simply by changing this parameter. You can observe how the whole gradient of the sky changes when we increase this height. This depth of these blue colors changes as well and the way the sky shines is also a bit different. What's more, the way the sky affects these shaded areas is also different because the very dynamics of what we see in this hemisphere of the sky has changed. Honestly, I would not focus too much on this value above sea level. We are not trying to recreate any realistic conditions here. Even if our scene is supposed to be somewhere very specific, let's say in the highlands, 1000 meters above the sea level, we don't need to nail it down exactly like in reality. But if you are looking for a simple way to adjust the sky color in the scene, this parameter will prove to be very useful. For example, if the sky is too pale, as you can see here, these colors are less pronounced, more uh, desaturated, brighter towards the horizon. This gradient is a bit clumsy. And you might want this blue to be more pronounced, the gradient to be somewhere closer to the horizon. With this value, you can easily control it all. Really, if you are using Corona Sky, pushing it up a little makes the whole image a lot more punchy. As you can see, there are quite a few things going on, but don't worry about it now. We'll talk about it in future lessons. For now, the last value we want to touch on in this lesson is volume effect. As we can see, it is turned off by default. But if we click it and turn it on, suddenly an aerial perspective appears in our scene. I will lighten this up a bit to make it more visible. So this is how you create the aerial perspective. The farther an object is from the camera, the more its color is modified towards the color of the sky. This is a very realistic effect and we'll talk about it in a little more even in this lesson. What's more, we can control the intensity of this effect. With a value of 10, it looks like this. And we can clearly see what it's all about, even in the interactive. Those mountains now look completely different than the objects closer to the camera. Contrasts on them are noticeably diminished. Their color is kind of pointing to the color of the sky. It's a typical aerial perspective and this corona volume effect simulates it very well. Just remember that this is not an actual fog, meaning it is not something that scatters the light in the scene. It is not something that interacts with the light. This is more of a color overlay and it works very fast when it comes to computing a scene. In general, it gives great results, very realistic, especially in scenarios like daytime or twilight. I really recommend using it. A value of one is a typically realistic value that takes into account a realistic distance in the scene relative to the camera. 
If the effect is too strong, you can, of course, reduce it, or just the opposite. If you want to pump up the perception of the scene, just increase it. Note that some effects of this color overlay may seem strange at higher values. Some discoloration may appear on closer objects. Sometimes some sun rays can shine through, but it is definitely worth experimenting with and using. It calculates really quickly, is pretty easy to set up and produces very good results. And that's all you will need to use Corona Sun and Sky for the time being. There is really no need to dwell on this anymore, so let's move on to our scenario. Up till now, our scene was all in white, so we will finally approach this scenario as it should look like. Ok, we launch our scene. You can follow us if you like it, but we'll be going through all this again in lesson 2 with Corona Sun and Sky, so take it easy, you won't miss a thing. When we create a scene from scratch, the first thing we probably need to do is change the rendering engine to Corona. Most likely the default engine for Max will be Arnold, so we need to change it to Corona Renderer. In our scene everything will be adapted for Corona of course. Obviously, we have quite a few tabs with rendering settings here. But at the moment, in Corona, we don't really have to worry about it. We can click Render and see what happens. The scene is parsing. But I can tell you right now that nothing will appear. We simply don't have any light yet in the scene. No sun, no sky. Our image will just be completely black. So we can stop it right there for a while, because like I said, we won't see anything. The other thing is that if we click the big render button, we'll render the final image. It's way more convenient to use interactive rendering when working on the scene. This way you will be able to react to the rendering in real time. Just click Start Interactive, here. Or click and hold here, and Start Interactive as well. While using Interactive, we need to double check which layers are active for our scene. As you can see now, the Assets High Poly and MOS High Poly layers are disabled and to work with Interactive we will turn on the Low Poly layers. This will make the process faster and more stable. It obviously depends on your computer, but we definitely recommend hiding the high poly layers while practicing. And when it comes to the quality of the displayed image, it shouldn't differ as much as to cloud our judgment. Ok, let's click Start Interactive and see what happens again. Of course, it's still black, because we didn't insert any lighting yet. So, it's about time to go to Create Panel, Lights, Corona Sun and insert a sun into our scene. Left click and hold. Drag it and click again. We can rotate the sun and let's find a cool angle. At this stage, we won't elaborate on why this direction works. We'll come back to it in the next practical lesson, so let's choose this direction and trust us with this one today. Obviously, we are lacking Corona Sky, so we go to the Modifiers tab and click Add Corona Sky. And it immediately pops up. Let's get back to the frame buffer settings. There's one last thing that you will have to trust us within that lesson. By default, 
ACES OT is enabled. We'll talk more about this feature in the following lessons, but for the purposes of this scene, we'll turn it off. Then, click this plus sign and select Filming Mapping. Expand it and set Highlight Compression to 1. Our image is a little too bright now, so we will lower the exposure. And that's it. Let's get to the real subject of this lesson. Okay, so let's move on to the second part of this lesson and discuss what makes the scenario look good or not, and what is problematic. What can we say at the moment? For starters, the foreground is grabbing too much attention. This building is completely lost. There's just too much details all over the foreground. It's light, dark, light, dark, light. Everything is just chaotic in this picture. And the truth is, it's hard to expect great results only by setting up Corona Sun and Sky alone, especially if the direction of the light is random. So yeah, something feels off. This can be very discouraging for many graphic designers, particularly if they have a hard time identifying the real problems. And the real problem in practically every picture is the depth, or lack of the depth. We briefly talked about the depth in the previous lesson about the composition, but what exactly is the depth? Let's put it this way. When you are rendering, you transfer the information from the three-dimensional scene into a two-dimensional image. This image has only height and width, so you want to bring the third dimension back somehow. So it's perfectly clear that this object is further away from the camera than, for example, this one. And of course, perspective can help with that to some extent. We intuitively understand how the vanishing lines work, that objects further away from us are smaller than those closest to us. However, we want to go a step further and approach depth from an artistic point of view. It's something we can apply to our image. You'll see in just a second. Usually, in the foreground, we have deep shadows and the sharpest contrast. Then, as we go deeper into the scene, the contrast of light and the shadows fade out. And the further away we go, they completely wash out. Look at these examples. In general, in all of them, the foreground is more or less hidden in the shadow. The closest something is to the camera, the greater the contrast are. The shadows are deeper, the highlights are brighter. The further from the camera, the smaller the contrast. If we look at those mountains on the horizon, the contrasts are very minimal. In most cases, we won't notice any contrast over there. If we look at our image, we can quickly notice there is no transition between objects in the foreground and the background. Contrasts are all over the place, and foreground takes away too much attention from the subject of our visualization. We'll soon sort it out, and we promise that it won't take that much time and effort. The thing is that we want to do all of it methodically. We want to reach the goal step by step. It's a common thing that 3D artists want to do all the things at once, and get discouraged pretty quickly if it doesn't look great right off the bat. They don't consider the fact that some areas of the image might look pretty good, and the problems are limited just to the very specific task. This is why we want to name these problems, solve them one by one. Today, we will introduce a specific way of thinking about lighting. We will approach it based on the layers in the scene. Each image can be split into distinctive layers associated with depth. You can name them foreground, midground, and background. Sometimes there can be fewer of them, sometimes more. Nevertheless, we will stick with three layers because that's the most common and it's exactly what we have in our situation here. We can clearly see the foreground smoothly transitioning into midground, which consists of the building and its nearest surrounding. The mountains and the sky itself are in the background. Each and every one of these layers need to work and look properly. We will analyze them one by one, but the sequence here might be a bit counterintuitive. 
we will start with the midground, move to the background next, and jump back to the foreground at last. Believe me, there's a way in this madness, so let's get at it. Let's start with the midground. This is where the subject of the rendering is usually placed, the hero, the protagonist, something that we are commissioned to show and should be presented in the best way possible. This is where the viewer's eyes should focus right away. We build this entire composition, those lines to lead to that focal point, right? So we can say that the midground will become the core of our image. It's beating hard. And this is why we want to start by lighting it correctly. This is just supposed to be done as well as possible. Another aspect of this layer is that we, as artists, have relatively the least creative freedom here. We need to show something that our client probably has already some very strong expectations of. They have already envisioned it in their minds and want that space and materials to look credible. And we need to comply with this perception, but at the same time, we want to make it as attractive as it's possible according to our expertise. The third layer of the image is the background. And it's sort of all in the name, honestly, that's pretty clear that it's going to be further away in the hierarchy. Those two layers here are set hundreds meters apart, so we expect them to appear different, don't we? Basically, the background needs to look physically correct in relation to the depth of the scene and what is in front of it. That's something we will see as soon as we jump into setting it up in the scene. Last but not least, the foreground. It is slightly counterintuitive because, come on, it makes up for half of the frame and we can already see that it has a tremendous influence on our perception of the image. It provides us with hints about the exact camera position, the distance to the subject. It gives us a lot of context and makes us much more grounded in the scene. We are very lucky though. Contrary to the other layers, the foreground gives a lot of creative freedom. It's the space your client hasn't even thought about yet, for the most part. They won't have any specific expectations, so you can freely slap your best quality assets here. Even if there is something that we need to comply with, like a landscape project, we still should have a lot to say about all the details. The decision on how to place an individual tree or a bush will be always ours and it's enough here to make it or break it. It's much, much more than we are able to say with the midground or background. We can juggle objects all around the camera and build shadows that fit our composition. All right, let's make a quick summary of what's coming up next. We'll start with the midground and make it pop. We'll make sure that it's higher in the hierarchy than the background. Lastly, we'll jump into the foreground to make sure that it doesn't dominate the composition and works well in the context of depth perception, just like in the examples we saw earlier. We are moving on to the practical part and all of it should be perfectly clear soon. At the very beginning, we can admit that it doesn't look great, right? There is one big chaos here, but we can try to look a bit differently at it. I have prepared some selections here and we will do something like this. And it may seem like awfully weird, but bear with us. We'll use a neat little trick. We'll turn a thing called Material Override. So let's open Material Editor and create the most basic legacy Corona material. 100% black, no reflections. We drag it to Material Override and all selected objects add here as excluded. And let's see how it looks now. What has happened here? Suddenly the building started to look fine. The midground is not that bad when we isolated it. 
we can understand the messing, the corner is clearly visible, the materials seem to be realistic with some distinctive micro contrast. We will talk about it much more in the lesson about light direction. As for now, we can only admit that it looks pretty neat. And I kind of tricked you a bit before because I ignored the background and the foreground in my imagination and I knew we are on the right track already. If you find it hard to imagine for yourself, you can always use this material override or simply hide over layers. I assure you that it will become natural for you after you get a little bit of experience. Obviously, we can move the sun around at the moment and really appreciate how it affects architecture. As I mentioned, it will be the subject of another practical lesson, but we can clearly see this relationship which was a bit vague earlier, overshadowed by all those foreground and background problems. Let's get back to the direction we had though. Alright, so we solved one problem, or we can say that it was already solved by the sun direction we suggested, but we just needed to look at it differently. The subject of this image looks fine, so we can consider our midground to be done. We need to move on to the background now. We think about layers and address problems one by one. So I can turn it off. Clean this list. I've got another selection here. Everything except for the foreground. Let's add those objects to override and click interactive again. We'll do the same trick, but the background will be visible this time. What happened? This part is supposed to be at the very back, but it doesn't look like this at the moment. You can notice the frequency of detail, the brightness between those far away trees and the closer ones in the midground. They basically look the same, the same values, the same colors. I would say that this background is stealing some of the attention and it looked better when we had it blacked out. What can we do about this problem? We've already mentioned it earlier. We can open Material Editor and Corona Sky Material. In this kind of scene where the depth is very significant, literally hundreds of meters between those layers, the aerial perspective is simply a must-have here. Not every scene will scream so much for it, but we won't be able to do anything here without it. So we want to open Corona Sky Material. It's going to be present either in the Environment tab, or here in Render Setup, Single Map, if we have it turned on. Wherever it is, we can drag it into Material Editor as the instance, and so we have access to all the settings. As I already mentioned, we can click on the Volume Effect and see what happens we get a sort of a one-click solution for aerial perspective. Certainly, we can make it weaker by lowering this value, or stronger by raising it. We can even get to the point in which it almost looks like a dense fog. Although, as I said, it's not a proper physically correct fog, Basically, high volume effect values push it more into the realm of a stylized look. Some sort of painterly effect that binds the entire image together. It might be not entirely naturalistic and this tint may sort of pierce through objects in the scene or cause different artifacts. The value of 1 is default 
and considered to be correct for realistic distance values. But we are of course free to modify it. We can tweak it to adapt this look to various lighting directions. We will talk about it more in the next practical lesson, but as for now, you can believe us that this value could be a bit higher, maybe too, to compensate for the sun position in the scene. Speaking about the background, it doesn't consist only of mountains, but also this visible part of the sky can be included in it. At the moment, it is really washed out. We will be talking much more about the proper color of the sky pretty soon in this training, but as for now, I can only mention that rising this altitude level will help make this appearance deeper. We can freely adjust it to alter the sky to our expectations. I don't mean that zero value is somewhat incorrect, but I think it is more attractive now. We can set it even a bit higher yet. Alright, we've got even more separation between the midground and the background. Perfect. We can clearly see that the second layer of the image is much more readable now. The trees, silhouette, the building, whatever happens behind this slope. Our subject moved forward and these trees seem more isolated. We kind of literally made two steps and we are already halfway done. That was sort of really quick. We started establishing this hierarchy of layers and the midground is really higher in it than the background. It's really fine now, so we can, I think, move on. Okay then, it's the foreground time. We can expect it to be sort of problematic. It used to be too bright, really stole the attention. I will just turn off this material override and we will find out. Interactive doesn't like this kind of huge changes, so I will also turn it off for a while. And indeed, it looks pretty messy. It doesn't look great if we were to evaluate it as a whole now. Even this building doesn't shine anymore in this new context. The foreground really pops up. The rocks are very bright. We just stare at it and don't notice the rest of the scene. The perception of the image is definitely worse than it was just a minute ago. And that foreground is a big problem, so let's try to understand it. Let's have a look at our scene. I might uh, turn it off here in this 3D view. So why does it behave like this and how to fix it? Let's have a look at this camera first. Can you see how this is built? You can see that the, the camera hangs at the edge of this huge void. There is nothing behind it and the light can pour in from everywhere. The scene is typically built according to what is visible in the frame. The light can fall in from behind, from above, below, left and right. It's not only the direct light from the sun, but the sky illumination also odds up here. The lack of any objects here is the result of the scene building and it's a very typical situation. Nobody will lose time and resources on something that won't be even visible in the final image. But we wouldn't have this empty space in reality. The terrain would continue. We would probably have some trees here, maybe even a fragment of the forest. Basically, there would be something instead of this bottomless void. Therefore, almost all scenes we encounter require some kind of intervention beyond what's visible in the camera. We need to move things around or add something to solve this biggest foreground issue and cut this intrusive light off. What can we do? 
We agreed that we wouldn't have this kind of situation in the real life. This amount of light falling from the back. Well, maybe in some rare scenarios, but that wouldn't result in a good photo as well. We have the option to model this terrain, add some trees and bring it closer to reality, but usually it's just an overkill that adds up to the time and memory used when rendering. We can do it much easier and the very easiest solution is to just put the simplest box here. As crude as it sounds, it's really effective and gives us a lot of control over how much light we let in. So let's just create the simplest object. I rotate it more or less to align it with the camera direction. We don't need to be very precise. I will lower it a bit because it kind of levitates now over the terrain. And I will apply a default gray material to it so that it doesn't glow with a random color. Let's see how it looks in the interactive now. Awesome, something's happening. And to push it even further, we need to modify this box just a bit. We can, you know, enlarge it on one side and another. Maybe lower a bit here. Basically, we can see that inserting this box introduces more shadow in the foreground because on the one hand it obviously blocks the direct sunlight, but on the other hand it also stops the scattered indirect light from the sky. So all reflections on the rocks, on the bark, they are all darkened, even if there was no direct sunlight hitting them before. It's all just naturally darker. Obviously, the box has a very geometrical, regular shape that isn't really what we want because it casts this very artificial, straight and sharp shadow over the foreground. And there are many ways to address this problem, but we will again try the simplest solution this time. A little trick. We'll just raise this side of the box up so as to place its shadow in one line with the shadow of the tree. Simple as that. We won't be able to recognize it as something artificial anymore because we borrowed that natural shadow edge from the real object. If we want more control, we can always convert this box to editable poly and tweak it even further. But it's fine for me as it is now. So we've got the shadow and connected it with the shadow of the tree. We can get yet a little bit of additional control by modifying the material that we applied to this box. It's default gray now, but changing albedo may have some impact. If we turn it white, it scatters some more light around and if we turn it black, it absorbs more. It won't be a huge difference, but it's an additional few percent of control and maybe even more if these foreground materials are more reflective than now. I will stick to the gray one though. This is how we solve the foreground problem in the simplest way possible. This is the part of the image that will be somehow problematic in a lot of scenes, so we will learn a bunch of other solutions later on. In this lesson we had our sun direction already set, 
and this plain box turned out to be everything we really needed. But there will be many more cases and some of them much more challenging. Some of these solutions might be funky and counterintuitive, but I would say that they are great as long as they work and are effective for us. All right, we can try to sum up what happened here composition-wise. The building finally pops as we intended. We can see that the shadows are deeper and the entire foreground is toned down. Even the feeling of depth in the image is much more profound. The hierarchy is built correctly. Our eyes are attracted to the subject and not the entourage in the foreground. This box introduction really worked and the dark foreground created this picture-in-picture -picture effect. We have a nice gradation of things that catch our attention and this usually is a very successful approach. Everything seems fine and we realized our first scenario. It looks naturalistic and correct. Certainly, we could push it even a bit further, tweak a few details, but it's totally fine for our first time. We will render with final production layers and we will be able to see it in its full glory and evaluate if everything really worked as we intended. So let me just turn high poly layers on and low poly off. And fast forward, we've got our render ready. If we want to save it now, we obviously need to click on the save button. Now we can choose the file type. We certainly don't want to use any compressed formats like JPEGs because we would just lose all our precious information. The rendering contains much more data than JPEG can contain and we want to have a freedom of modifying it we would need something better here. I usually use PNG because that's basically all that I need. You can also use TIF or 32-bit EXR if you really want to get everything that Corona gives you. I will just stay with PNG. Let's type in the name and choose RGB 48-bit option which stands for three channels with 16-bit depth each. It's plenty of information. I've got these two options checked off in this case and here we go. Click OK and it's saved. OK, we are good to go. Let's make a brief recap and take one more look at the progress we made. First, we put the sun in the scene. Overall, the image didn't feel great yet, but what important was that our midground and the architecture looked OK. Secondly, we introduced the first layer of depth, which was the aerial perspective. And it already set some hierarchy in the image. Lastly, we focused on the foreground and covered it in the shadow. We used a simple box behind the camera this time, but we will have different and more advanced techniques in the future lessons for this very purpose. So as to sum up, we really wanted to turn your attention to solving problems in the image one by one instead of dealing with everything at once. We constructed this training in a way that will give you a lot of these smaller tools. You will see it soon. Let's just start thinking with layers from today. Sometimes it will be easier to isolate and control them in an image. Sometimes it might be harder, but you will get used to it after a few tries. Next lesson will be all about training our eyes, a really cool a theoretical piece. The one after this will be about choosing the right light direction and we hope you will also enjoy it. See you there.